Hey, uh, I want to just encourage you this morning that uh, that uh, this sermon series is based on the Christmas carol we sang this morning. That is one of my favorites. I would just say it is my favorite. Oh, holy night! And I don't know if you know the um, that if you know the history behind that. And Ethan, can you give me my table? Uh, I don't know if you know the history behind the the. Um, the story of how we got this song, Oh Holy Night. Uh, but you may not know this, this history, but I think it's a special part of what makes this song what it is. You see, in 1847, thank you. In 1847, there was a Catholic parish priest in France that uh, had hired a poet to write a poem for his Christmas services at church. So he got a local poet and he said, would you write a Christmas poem for my church so we can celebrate the Christmas season together? And the writer, the poet, uh, the poet took the book of Luke as his inspiration. And the way he wrote the song is that he imagined himself standing in the midst of the scene that Luke tells about the birth of Jesus and the surrounding events. And he used it as the inspiration uh, imagining himself there. After finishing writing the poem, he asked a local well-known classical musician to, per, to put music to his words. The irony of this story is, is that the poem, uh, the poet, excuse me, was not a churchgoer. But reading the scriptures, this is the imagery that began to speak to him. And the writer of the music was actually a, a Jewish man who did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Soon after this Christmas celebration in this little town in 1847, this song became very popular in the country of France. And pretty soon, it wasn't just a couple of years before every church, Catholic church in France was singing this song to celebrate the season of Christmas until the word got out that the two people that wrote the songs were not Catholic churchgoers. And then the song became banned from the church in France. Ten years later, we find the song being brought back in the United States as someone uh, in 1855, John Sullivan Dwight, translated the song into English and bring, brought it to America. He particularly loved this song because it was during slavery in America and John Sullivan Dwight was an abolitionist who was so moved by the, by the line in the song in one of the verses that says, the slave is our brother. And he was so moved by this line that it became a song that he wanted to introduce to everybody in recognition that Jesus came to bring salvation, but he also came to break chains that enslaved us both spiritually and and physically to set us free. And this song became very special and very popular, especially in the North during the Civil War. But really what made this song as popular as it is today was an event that happened on December 24th, 1906. A Canadian inventor, uh, Reginald uh, Fasten, uh, uh, Fasten then, who invented the radio and how to use live radio waves to get the broadcast out there. He invented that technology in 1906 on December 24th, Christmas Eve. He played the first live ever transmitted song over the airwaves, which was Oh Holy Night. He played the violin while singing it. And that propelled its launch into his popular Christmas carol that it is today. But you know, this song continues to bring inspiration to this world. Last week, and maybe you saw this, there was a video that began to become popular and, and go viral around the internet of a nurse singing this song with her chemo patient. He had had his cancer go into remission and he, he was excited and all that stuff. And after a few years, it had come back and he was discouraged and distraught the fact that he was facing this fight again and the nurse could tell he was down and she knew he was a musician in Nashville that had played for in, in different uh, arenas for over 30 years. And so she brought her own guitar into the hospital room and allowed him to play and she sang with him. I want you to see this video on the screen. 
All of social media on all the different platforms and news stations all over the country picked up this clip and showed this nurse singing Oh Holy Night with her chemo patient. It's a song of inspiration. It's a song that brings hope. It's a song of promise. Not only now, but for generations, this song has pointed to the eternal hope during the Christmas season. Because people want hope. That's why this song is popular. It's a song that speaks of hope and people want hope. They need hope. It's something, it's something that brings a glimmer of hope and promise that things can change, that things can improve, that there's something good to hold on to that brings promise, not only for today, but for tomorrow. The message of Christ's coming conveys the possibility of hope. Not just for my life, but for the whole world. And it started with a promise. The promise that was delivered by the prophet Isaiah in one of the darkest times in Israel's history. Last week I read to you Isaiah 9-2, for a light shined in the darkness. That prophecy continues in Isaiah 9-6 and it says, For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It was a promise. You see, that was a promise of hope when there looked like there was no hope. There was no evidence whatsoever for the people of God to think that there's hope except for the promise. But in a little town called Bethlehem, most likely in a cave where animals were kept, this promise was kept. He made the promise in Isaiah and he kept the promise in the New Testament. Jesus, the son of God, stepped down from heaven, entered a broken and fallen world to be, bring the light into our darkness. This is the season of hope. And today I want to share with you a couple of steps that you can take, practical steps, things that you can personally do in your own life to increase your hope in your life. You may be in a place right now where the people of God were at during the day of Isaiah. Your blessings are squandered, the enemy is winning, and your future may seem surrendered. There's still hope. That's what the season is all about. And you may not be in that place. And you may be in a place where you've discovered the hope of salvation for, of Christ. But do you know that you, God wants to increase your hope? He wants to increase your hope that you can walk in hope and in strength. So I want to talk to you today about three steps that leads to greater hope. The first is this. We have to receive hope. We have to receive it. Hope is an interesting thing. You know, because here's the deal. Every one of us in this room knows a story of inspiration and breakthrough that God has brought someone else. You've all heard a story. Look what God did for me over here, or God did this miracle over there. We've got story after story of what God has done in other people. But do you know that just knowing those stories does not guarantee that you have hope? You can know those things and still in your own personal circumstance, not feel hopeful. 
Hope is an interesting thing. Why wouldn't some of those stories inspire us to have hope in our own lives? It's because it's only when someone receives hope and believes in something that holds a promising outcome that it begins to affect my way of life. I have to receive it. Paul knew this and even had concern for the church that he pastored in Ephesus. They had great success in sharing the gospel and people getting saved in a large city that was committed to idol worship, the whole city. But yet God, the message of hope, uh, uh, came in and began to radically transform this area. But Paul had not been with them in a while. In fact, he was in jail and he thought he may never see them again. So as a pastor, he had concern for them and their walk of hope and their walk in Christ. And he wanted to share with them some things that he wanted to encourage them. He knew that they had to receive hope on their own. And he knew that they had to commit their way to hope so that it would change their lives, not just for that moment of salvation, but ongoing throughout their lives. Listen to what he tells them in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. There's two things today that help us receive the hope of God that Paul is encouraging the people to do. And the first is this. He says, let God enlighten the eyes of your heart. The word enlighten literally means to shine upon or to give light to. To shine upon or give light to. Paul is asking the people in the church that he loves to give, uh, to, to allow God, he wants God to give light or shine light that brings hope into their lives. True hope, eternal hope requires the living God to impact the conditions of our hearts that we have become accustomed to living in the darkness and the shadows of this world. Paul is saying this, hope doesn't come without a supernatural transaction. Listen, he's saying this, listen, we live in a world that has dark shadows and you can name your shadow. All of our shadows have different things. It can be health struggles. It can be fears that are going on. It can be insecurities. All of our shadows have different titles. But what Paul is acknowledging is, is when you live in this world, you cannot live without walking and experiencing and even become accustomed to the shadows of this world. And he says, in order to have hope in the midst of those shadows, there's got to be a supernatural transaction that takes place. God himself has to give light to, bring light, shine light into your, what? Heart. Into your heart. Even as believers, do you know this? That we can grow accustomed to living in shadows or into dark things that we encounter into this world. I mean, we believe in Jesus. We believe that the manger that was in here this morning, that it, it held our Savior and that he did die on a cross. But far too often, believers get accustomed to shadows, stuff we have to walk through, things that we have to endure, places where we have to fight spiritual battles, those kinds of things in our life. And Paul says, in the midst of those shadows, don't forget to have the supernatural experience where God himself supernaturally shines his light upon your heart so that you will have hope as you're walking through the journey of those shadows. It's a supernatural experience. You see, when you become accustomed to something, you function in that reality. Why? Because you don't really know anything else. You're accustomed to it. When your heart breaks, we don't hope in the reality that it can be healed. When we're trapped in our sin and our mistakes, we don't know the hope that there is one who sets people free. When we experience grief and loss, we don't hope in the one who comforts and the one, the one who comforts the one who mourns. When we face death, we don't hope in the one who promises eternal life. It becomes what we're accustomed to. It's our reality. This is how life is. This is how it always goes. It's our reality. And we don't look for anything else because our hearts don't know that there is anything else. But when God does a work in us and causes us to become accustomed to the light that shines, guess what happens? Hope sets in. Paul is strategic when he says, and he says uh, that the eyes of your heart have to be enlightened. You see, the eyes 
Your eyes in your physical body is what brings in input, what you see. It receives the images. It receives the input into our life. So the eyes of their heart, what is he saying? He's saying, your heart needs to receive the hope that God came to bring. It's not good enough to know about it. It's not good enough to hear about it. It's not even good enough to see the results of it in someone else. Your eyes of your heart have to receive it. It has to come and settle and make its home in you. Hope has to come in you. God's light has to shine in you. Your heart has to receive his light. You know what we say with someone who is not really that believable? What's the line we always say that to, to them? I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when I see it. You might have said that to your kids in their teenage years, right? With their, I'll do it, I'll do it. I'll believe it when I see it. People say this to their spouses or their loved ones who have made promise after promise and not come through. I'll believe it when I see it. It might be someone who owes you money because you're the one that's got a debt. Uh, they hold a debt with you. I'll believe you'll pay it back when I see it. You see, we believe when we see because when we see, we receive the input. We receive the message that this is going to happen. Paul says, I pray for you that this supernatural interaction will happen where God himself shines his light into what you're accustomed to, what you think is no hope for. And he shines that light into your heart and that the eyes of your heart, the receptacles of your heart will receive that message and it will give you hope even though for now you have to walk through some shadows. Will you receive it? The second thing Paul says today that, we, that helps us receive is that once that light shines, that you will begin to know. Know is about relationship. Know is about being familiar. To know the hope in which you were called. When your eyes are enlightened, you can know hope. Not just know about hope. You can know it intimately for yourself. What is he saying? What does it mean to be called to hope? You see, when we hear somebody talk about hope, can we be, or talk about being called? Can we be honest? When somebody says, I'm called, we hear that as kind of like a, uh, something that disqualifies us, right? Kind of all of a sudden, immediately, we find ourselves thinking in that process like we're back in sixth grade being chosen for the dodgeball team, right? I'm not going to get called. I'm just going to be last. Paul says, I, you were called to hope. That you would know the calling of hope that God has upon your life. I want to show you something. In the original Greek language in which the Bible in New Testament was written, the word to describe called here in this passage actually has two distinct ideas shoved into the same word and they play off of each other. But when we say called, we oftentimes only hear one side of the word. Paul is saying this when he says called, two, two distinct ideas in the same word. The first idea is, is obviously the one we know, called, which means this, a loud, distant voice requesting you to come. I'm called, right? It's getting your kids to the dinner table. Dinner! It's a loud, distant voice from around the corner into the kitchen telling me to drop what I'm doing and come to the table right? God is calling you and it may not feel like he's near and it may not feel like he's present, but in the distance, you can hear a voice that is calling out to you. You're being called. That's the first idea. The second idea is out or separate is another part of that Greek word to be called out or to be called separate, which means to be removed from the mixture of. There's a voice this is what Paul says, that you may know the hope in which you were called because there's a voice that may not seem near to you right now. It may seem distant, but he is calling out to you. And what he's calling out to you is to come out. Come out from the darkness. You weren't meant to live there. I didn't create you for darkness. I created you for light. I'm calling you out of darkness and into my light so that you can hope. It's called out. You're called out today. 
Paul was wanting you to know that you are the called out ones. God who is shining his light has called us from the place of darkness. Hey you, you don't belong there. Come out and come to me. Hope begins to rise when you start to know in your heart, I don't belong here. In this darkness, in the shadows of this world. And there is someone who is calling out to me in the light, calling me to the light. Hope is knowing that I have light even as I pass through the shadows. The shadows of this life and your life may last for a moment. Listen to me. But you have been called out from living there in that place and received the light of the salvation of God and his light is still shining. I hope because I have received what God has done for me. When you feel a shadow in your life, you maybe have a shadow in your life right now in this very moment. No matter whether Christmas is coming and presents are under a tree and family's coming over for a joyful dinner, you still feel the grief. You still feel the conflict. You still feel the strife. You still feel the pressure of the weight that's looming over you. You may have that shadow right now. And when you have that moment and being in that shadow and you experience that darkness, would you remember today that there's a light shining that is calling out to you from the distance? Hey, you, I'm calling out to you. Don't stay in that place. That's the hopeless place. I'm calling you out. I'm shining my light let your heart receive the hope that I have to give you in the midst of that darkness. We have to receive hope. The second thing this morning is this. We have to hold on to hope. We have to hold on to hope. I'm so glad. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that God gives us scriptures that not only included the great supernatural eternal truth of his word, but also has stories of normal people walking on the same journey to follow God as I am. And when I mean normal, I mean imperfect, screwed up, Bad thought process, just like me. He gives us these stories to help us know that I'm normal. And when I say normal, I'm saying I'm flawed. And this lesson that we learn from them in the scriptures is that hope is a journey. Hope is not just a one moment time where God comes and shines his light and was born in a manger and he didn't need to do anything else and he doesn't have anything else to say. No, hope is a journey that we have a starting point and we have an ending point, but there's also a middle point. There's an in-between. The journey of hope is where you have to live it out before the outcome that you're wanting and wishing for and hoping for comes. While you're facing the highs and lows that life brings, you have to live out the hope. You have to wait on the hope. Over and over again, Paul addresses those people in the scripture and he writes these pe- to the scriptures and he says things either positive or negative to the normal people like us that are flawed. Sometimes he'll say things like, hey, what happened to you? Who cut in on your faith? Why are you not believing and hoping anymore? Or to others, he'll say things like, I praise God every time I think of you for your partnership with me in the gospel and the ministry. I know that he who began a good work in you is going to complete it. And I'm glad that you're trusting in that and you're staying firm. You see, we're all over the place in the journey. Some days we feel it and some days we don't. Some days we know that he's faithful and some days that we don't. Some days that we do really well in trusting him and some days we don't. Hope is a journey. Paul kept writing the believers to encourage them to stay strong in their faith, to stand firm against the things that had come to harm their faith. You know, the truth, of the, the, hard, the truth is that the hardest part of hope is waiting for the outcome. Right? It's fun to receive the promise. Oh, yes. Thank you, God, for that promise. And it's going to be fun when we receive the outcome of the promise. The hard part is waiting for the promise to come. I can imagine as a, one of the people of God in the Old Testament, the hardest part was in between Isaiah's word and Jesus' coming. See, that's where we have to live every day, isn't it? We have to live in the waiting. We have to live in the journey. We have to live in those moments. And let's be honest. Can we be honest for a second? We're not really that good at waiting. We have our time waiting for our cell phones to charge, for our food to get warmed in the microwave. We can't wait on anything. We have no time for waiting. 
And when it comes to God's promises and it comes to the things that he tells us to hope in, it's hard to wait. But Paul helps believers to know that even in the waiting, it's not done in our strength. If you're trying to wait on the Lord and his promises in your own strength, you're going to have a hard time with that. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, about the waiting in the hope. May the God of hope fill you with joy, all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's some people in this room today, I believe you need to underline that verse and make it your life verse. What do we need on this journey? What do we need on this What do we really need, right? God, I don't need more income. I mean, that'd be nice, but more income doesn't secure my peace. God, I could use more this and more that. And there's lots of things that make our list that we ask him for, isn't there? But if you boil it all down, what do we really, really need from God in the waiting? We need joy. Amen. And we need peace. We need joy. And we need peace. When we lose joy and when we lose peace, that's when things get really ugly. We need joy. And peace. And Paul knows that these are the two things. When you boil it all down, this is what we really need from God in the waiting. You need joy and peace. And how do we get it? By trusting him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace as you trust him. The focus is on trusting him. But all too often, what do we focus on? The outcome. I'm hoping, God, when are you going to do it? I'm hoping, God, it's been a little too long. I'm hoping, God, you said you were gonna do this and I'm really getting tired of waiting. Can you get this done already? I'm hoping. I mean, God, if you're not gonna do it, just tell me right now. That way I can get on with my life and I don't have to worry about it. I'm hoping we're focused on the outcome. When is it gonna come? How's it gonna come? How's he gonna do it? When's he gonna do it? What's it gonna look like? How am I gonna feel when he's gonna do it? And Paul says, that's not the focus. In the waiting, the focus is on the trusting. The trusting. This is how we hold on to hope. If you make it your aim to trust him, you walk and receive all joy, all peace. That is unexplainable because why? The power of the Holy Spirit, Paul says, is released to do that work in you as you trust. But when we don't trust and we focus on the outcome, we get frustrated in the waiting we begin to go through the journey with other think, trusting in other things. You know, I didn't grow up in a perfect family. You know why? Because no one did. Right. My parents are going to be here next service, so they'll get to hear this illustration. And I didn't know they were going to be here this Sunday to be a part of service, to hear this illustration. But I didn't grow up in a perfect family. No one does. But you know what I did do? I grew up in a hopeful family. I grew up in a hopeful family. And I don't know if that was your reality growing up on your journey as you were raised up. Maybe you weren't raised in a hopeful family. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. You know, time and time again, I saw my parents respond to certain situations that I believe the enemy brought or the world brought into their lives, our lives, that were designed to rob them of their faith in God. And I watched their response over and over and over again. They trusted God with their kids' salvation. You know, as a parent, for your kids, I mean, you want to see them go to college. You want them to succeed. You want them to not live in your house forever. You, know, you, want, to, you want a lot of things, right, for your kids. But at the end of the day, as believing parents, nothing brings greater joy than when your kids love Jesus. And it's all you really want because you know if they love Jesus, the rest of that stuff somehow will take care of itself. And when they don't love Jesus, you, it's, it's hard to not just live in a constant state of worry and, and, and fear of what, what's, what's gonna happen. And so you want, it's nothing. And they trusted and they prayed and they believed. There was a time, I share this in, in joking, but there was a time my mom was thinking that I was demon possessed. She prayed her guts out. But it wasn't just me, all my brothers, we all walked through stuff. All of us, my brother, my sister. 
They trusted God in their business dealings. There were some times it got ugly. I remember calling my dad one day and he hadn't slept in three nights because the weight and the stress and the pressure of the business was just so over him. He couldn't, he couldn't cope. They trusted God with their health issues, with emotional brokenness, with broken relationships in our family. We're not a perfect family. We've had some broken relationships. They trusted God. And time and time again, I would remember us running to prayer, having prayer times on Christmas Eve together as a family, having prayer lists sent to each other, having times where we'd call each other and say, I'll be praying for that. And we're still praying. We have things on the list right now that are not answered. We're praying. But they led us in being hopeful. The journey's not over, but God has brought joy to the journey in my parents' life, in their life. He's answered prayers. He's come through time and time again. But the journey's not over. There are still things being contended for and hoped for and believed for right now that are not solved, that are not changed, that are not healed. I've learned a lot about hope watching them. And the biggest thing I learned in watching them was why they do it. Why they did that. Why they held on to hope when some things were pretty bad. You know why they did it? Because they were convinced of one thing. He's faithful. He's faithful. And if we just trust, he's faithful and he will do the rest. The writer of Hebrews agrees Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he that promised is faithful. You won't have a perfect family. You, none of you will, so stop trying. You're not gonna have a perfect Christmas this Christmas. You're not gonna have a perfect year next year. But you can have a hopeful one you can have a, a year where you hoped, a year where you trusted, a year where you held on to the hope that God gave you because you know, no matter how it looks right now, God is faithful. You're on a journey. You've received hope, but the outcome of your hope has not yet come. Do not make the mistake of the world that today makes who struggles and strives and worries and fears and copes until something changes. Trust. Hold on to hope. And his peace and his joy will mark your way. That's what God, uh, Paul says in the scriptures. Hold on to hope. Number three this morning is this. Be on the lookout. Be on the lookout for hope. Paul caught wind in the church in Corinth that there were a few there that were starting to doubt and question this idea of resurrection. They started out wondering, is it really true we're going to be in heaven someday? I'm not sure about that resurrection for us. And it ended up, once they played that logic out long enough, they were doubting the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And he caught wind that there was some of this doubt, some of this angst that was going around the church about the issue of resurrection. And he has this really interesting statement he makes to them in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. He says this, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of, of all people most pitied. Think about that statement for a second. If it's only in this life that we're hoping, and we have hope for God to just do stuff in this life and nowhere else, we should be pitied. Because without the resurrection, without him getting up from the dead, then we're all here suffering. We're all here hoping. We're all here believing. We're all here going to church and trying to read our Bibles and do all this and even suffering in the shadows for nothing. It all hinges on the resurrection. Paul explains to him that his resurrection and their hope were tied together because Jesus got up from the dead. We can hope 
If Jesus didn't get up from the dead, then all we have done is believed in false hope. Paul goes on to give proof of the resurrection and he gives all these arguments and all these proofs and you can read them. They're all in 1 Corinthians 15. And the journey of hope ends uh, uh, ends with our new life in Christ in heaven for all eternity. This is what Paul is trying to, 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 uh, to drive home today. Over and over and over again, the disciples and Paul kept pointing out to eternal hope. Whenever you read The scripture that says, and this is our eternal hope. He's talking about not just hope on here for the things we're praying for. He's talking about eternity. Eternal hope. Hope that lives forever and is going to keep living forever. And it's going to keep bringing blessing forever because it's an eternal hope. Yes, we have hope on earth. And it's awesome to be able to know we have a God who's Emmanuel, who's God with us, God who answers prayer, God who never leaves us, God who never forsakes us. It's awesome to have that, but that's not the fullness of hope. The fullness of hope is that someday, like Revelation says, we're going to be standing around the throne in the glassy sea. For those of you that don't know what the glassy sea is, that means because we've been perfected in the glory of Christ, we are now reflecting the glory of God. And it's so bright. It just looks like a glassy sea with the sun beating down and God's glory is being shown. We will be standing in that glassy sea, worshiping God. No sin, no shame, no pain. The foundation for their confidence is this season right now. Jesus came and stepped out of heaven and came to earth. He kept his promise. Isaiah promised it hundreds of years ago and he kept his promise. And if he kept that promise, guess what? The new promise he makes, that's gonna be fulfilled too. Promise kept, promise made. The same way I came to you to bring salvation, I will return. I'm coming back. He, his promise is is coming. We have hope that this eternal, this eternal promise is going to be fulfilled just like the other one was. Scripture after scripture calls us to look out for hope, to be ready, to be alert, to look forward to the greatest outcome of hope that we can ever know, to be in heaven, in God's presence for all eternity. And because he kept his promise for his people for salvation, he will keep this one too. Listen to 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. He's coming back. He's coming to get his sons and daughters. He's coming to deliver once and for all his people from the brokenness and the darkness of this world. My hope is set on this promise. Peter tells us this is where my hope is set and this is where your hope is set. Be on the lookout for hope. My expectation is fixed. My heart and my eyes are looking up. My hope is greater than just what happens here on this earth. Even if I experience disappointment on this earth, there's a greater hope coming. This is the hope of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who knows they're facing the hottest flame that that has ever been faced, that they're gonna get thrown into the fire for standing up and believing and worshiping their God. And they say, my God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, he's got great things in store for us. It's an eternal hope. That's the hope of believers God is able to deliver me from whatever I'm facing. But even if he doesn't, there's a greater hope I'm on the lookout for. Why does the scripture call us to look out for hope? Because if we don't, we will become earthly minded. We will stop living for eternity and start living for today. And when we get that way, that's the quickest way to lose hope. I'm not living for here. I'm living for there. This is the call to all believers. Don't miss it this Christmas season. Don't miss it. This boy in a manger, 
is the reason for hope. And his arrival here is the proof positive that God is the one who keeps his promises. And he's going to keep the last one. You better believe it. Now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. He's faithful. Would you stand with me this morning? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? Just a reflective time before we leave this morning. God wants to increase your hope. I'm grateful for the hope you have now, but he wants to increase it. He wants to make you a person where your life is marked by peace and joy, not because all your circumstances are worked out, but because you have received the hope, you're holding on to it, and you're looking for the promise to be fulfilled. And as you walk in that way as a believer, there is no doubt that you will face a shadow or two or many more. There's no doubt that the things of this world will make it to our doorstep. But there's also no doubt that he's the God that is calling out to you. He's calling you out from that place of darkness. He's calling you out to a place of faith. He's calling you out to a place, a place where you believe and you stand firm that my God is faithful. And I don't belong here in these shadows. He's shining his light. Be on the lookout. Let him increase your hope this Christmas season. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Lance, Truly, if I'm honest, I've never, I've never surrendered my life to God and received the hope. I haven't received the forgiveness. I haven't received the work. I haven't started my relationship with God. I haven't prayed that prayer that invited him to have control of my life. I've heard it. I've listened to you tell stories. I've seen the testimonies. But I need to receive it today. He's shining his light. My heart needs to receive it today. If that's you today, I'd love nothing more than to be able to pray with that, that with you this morning. If that's you today, you say, Pastor Lance, I want to receive it today. How many of you would say that? If that's you, would you raise your hand today? Nobody looking around, just a private moment between you, me, and the Lord. Thank Anybody today? I need to receive God's hope for my life today. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Lance, I need the Lord to do that supernatural thing Paul talked about in the waiting. I need him to teach me more about trust. I need him to help me in the waiting. I don't do so good in the waiting sometimes. And I need the Lord by the power of his Holy Spirit to mark my journey with joy and peace as I learn to trust him more. And you just want the Lord's help in that process. You don't do it in your own strength. You won't do it. You won't make it. You gotta do it in the strength of the power of the Holy Spirit. If that's you today, say, Pastor Lance, I need help in the waiting today. Would you pray for me and believe today as I'm on the journey, I'm in the journey, but I need hope in the wait. I need his power in the waiting. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand? I'd love to pray for you this morning. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, we love you. God, I want to thank you for the message of this season. Lord, help us not miss it. Help us not overlook it. Help us not get too busy where we turn away and get consumed with other things. God, you're calling us out. And Lord, I know there's some people in this room that are walking through some dark things. And Lord, they've heard the stories and they've heard the testimonies. But today, what they need to know is your promise. They need to receive, God, your word of promise 
today as you shine the light upon their hearts. And God, today would you help them to hold on, to remain faithful, to trust, to acknowledge your faithfulness and your goodness, and to know, God, you're not done yet. And so, God, we hold on and trust. That's our part. It's the only part we can play. We trust you. So I'm praying for my friends today to raise their hand. Whatever they're walking through, God, today, would you give them strength in the waiting? Give them, Lord, your Holy Spirit in the waiting, your empowerment in the waiting. Because, God, you are up to something, and you are calling them out of that dark shadow. And you, Lord, will establish your light in their situation today and the days to come. And so, Lord God, in the waiting until the promise is fulfilled, God, help us to trust you. Help us to look upon you. Help us to receive your word. Help us to stand in obedience. And help us, Lord God, to live the life you've called us to live. And thank you for your Holy Spirit to give us the strength to do it. God, show up and show off in their situation. Demonstrate your supernatural power in the things they're walking through, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name, we love you. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said this morning, amen. I would love, I would love to sing this song together today. It's the bridge to I will build my life. And this is a declaration today that we will choose to trust in the Lord no matter what comes our way. Can we sing this together? And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in